evening, everyone. If you have a Bible, please open to Revelation. <clears throat> I like the subject of identity theft or identity in general. I think understanding where we come from is an important question that we often get asked in life. If you have a complicated background, answering that question, you always have to think twice and always have to try and second guess what the person asking the question is really asking when they ask the question, who are you or where do you come from? Growing up here in this country, even though I was born and raised here, neither of my parents were born or raised in England. So when I was asked, where do I come from, or who am I? Well, are you asking me the town I live in? The street I live on? Are you asking me what passport I hold? Are you asking me where my parents come from? Are you asking me the question because you think I look different to you? And all these questions flow through your mind in a split second when you kind of get asked, who are you, or where do you come from? Growing up as a child of first-generation immigrants, some of you would fit into that category, it was always drilled into us that we came from where our parents came from. And we didn't come from here. And that was explicitly drilled into our head. And to say anything different would be to deny our birthright, so to speak. You would say you come from this country, even though you'd never been there, maybe. Identity. People struggle with it. As to answer that question as to who we are. But the theme this week is identity what? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we start. Father in heaven, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me at this time. I pray, Lord, that your word may be clear, and I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would pierce through and touch our hearts. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if you were to steal something from somebody, hypothetically, I would think there are certain people from whom it's easier to steal from than others. Now, let me give you an example. On the screen there behind me, you can see a picture of a guitar. It's a guitar that my wife owns and sometimes plays. Rarely. Her uncle gave her the guitar. It's a... It's, uh, well, it's kind of squashed a little bit on that screen there. It's a mini guitar. It's not a full guitar, but it's not as small as a ukulele. It's not as big as a guitar. It's kind of like somewhere in the middle. Her uncle gave her the guitar and said, you know, here you are. If you want to learn to play, play this. Now, if you were to steal this guitar from our house, let's say I invite you around, you come to our house and enjoy some fellowship, and as you're leaving or as you're packing the car, you pack my, my wife's guitar in your car as you go, we would notice pretty quickly that you'd stolen our guitar. The reason being, there's only one in our house. Now, my wife's uncle who gave her the guitar, I don't know how many guitars he has. He plays ukulele, he plays 
I don't know if you say professionally, he plays all the time. He, he converted his basement into a 60-seater basement, and they have guitar concerts, whatever you call it. He probably has 30 or 40 guitars lying around his house of all shapes and sizes. If you wanted to steal one of his, he may not notice straight away. He may not notice straight away. Now, if you were to come to my house and look on one of these bookshelves and say, huh, there's a book I like, and God take it. I don't have that many books, but I know all the books on my shelf. And I've got them, maybe I'm a little bit, what's the word, OCD. I've got them by section. These are my books on the Sabbath. These are my books on Daniel, Revelation, Sanctuary, Reformation history, Adventist history. If you were to pick one off and take it with you, I would know. Because I know what's there. But let's say you went to the Manchester University Library and you slipped one of their books off and took the tag out and put it in your bag. It would probably be a lot longer before someone noticed because there's that many more there. My point is, it's easier to steal from someone who has more than from someone who has little. Identity theft. We're talking about us as Adventists. We're talking about us as Christians. We're talking about us living in this world today. And how our identity might be taken away from us. Do we have a lot or do we have a little as Christian Seventh-day Adventists in this world today? I would argue to you that we have a lot. That we have a lot. In fact, the Bible even says that we have a lot. There's a famous verse we hear it quoted oftentimes in Adventist churches from week to week or from month to month or from quarter to quarter, Revelation 3 and verse 17, where the Bible says, because thou sayest, I am what? Rich and what? Increased with goods and have need of? The Bible describes us as a rich people that have many goods and we don't feel a lack of anything. Could it be that we're so rich that by, we're losing things around our identity and it doesn't even bother us because we just feel we have so much? We're not bothered that some group or somebody doesn't believe in the 26th fundamental. doesn't really matter that because we've got 27 more doesn't really matter that this prophecy is not getting uh, attention or that so-and-so is m completely massacring that belief in the Bible. doesn't matter because we got all of this other stuff as well. And we have such a wealth of information, a wealth of knowledge, that it seems we're just kind of getting chipped away at, unfortunately. You can only have your identity taken away. I want to say you can only. To have your identity taken away, it indicates that at some point you had to know your identity in the first place. You had to know it for it to be taken away. If you don't know it, it's just kind of, it may be taken away, but you're, un, you're un, un, unaware that it's going away. Where in the Bible do we find the passages that deal with our identity today? What is our identity today? Turn to Revelation. We're going to look at three chapters briefly in the short time that we have. Three chapters briefly in the short time that we have. Because each one covers a different aspect of our identity. You know they say the three big questions in life. What are the three big questions in life? Well, that's a big one. That's not the one I'm looking for, though. 
Where do we come from? <laughs> Before we ask where we go, where do we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Those are the real big questions that no matter what your religious or faith background is, those are the questions that you could say trouble mankind. Where do I come from? Why am I here? And where am I or where are we going? Those three questions we found answered in three chapters of Revelation, three chapters that are very important to our identity, and three chapters that I believe we shouldn't just know the reference to, but we should actually be able to know them and be able to unpack them, because it forms who we are. Understanding our background gives us a greater sense of surety in this world today. Revelation 10 is the first chapter that I'd like to take you to, Revelation chapter 10. And in Revelation chapter 10, it's probably one of the most underrated chapters of Revelation that I think we, we have. We know about Revelation 14, we know about Revelation 12, we know about Revelation 20, the millennium, and the seven churches is chapters 2 and chapters 3. Revelation 7, you've got the, the, uh, the 144,000. Revelation 10, though, I believe is a crucial, crucial chapter when we're understanding what our identity is as Seventh-day Adventists. Revelation 10 describes, in some ways, the historical experience, or you could also say, not just the historical experience, but you are, I would add to that and say, the theological roots of the Adventist church you find in Revelation 10. Revelation 10, we'll also look at 12 and 14, but not right now. Revelation chapter 10 is just 11 verses. It's not a long chapter. And if we were to do an overview of Revelation chapter 10, there would be a few things that would cover. Revelation chapter 10, how many angels are there in that chapter? We've got an angel that comes down from heaven to earth in verse 1. Then we have a little book that is open in his hand, verse 2. Then we have him one foot on the sea and one foot on the earth. Then we have him crying with a loud voice as when a, when a lion roars and seven thunders are uttered. Then we have him swearing by him that lives forever that there should be time no longer. Then we have him giving John a book to eat. Then we have John eating the book. And then we have the bitter experience. After the bitter experience, John is told to prophesy again. Now, we're not going to go through all of these points in detail tonight. We don't have time, and that's not the purpose of, of, of our presentation this evening. This is just an overview of the chapter of Revelation chapter 10. Now, in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 2, when the Bible says he had in his hand a little book open, and he set it, his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice. Question for you, what is the little book open in his hand? The little book open. Revelation 10, he gives him a book. And he says, the book is what? How do you describe the book? First of all, he says it's little. And second of all, he says that the book is... Test, 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 test. Both working. How does he describe it? He says, it's, it's a little book. He says, open. Before we get to the sweet and bitter and stuff, he says, it's a little book that is open. Now, when a little book is open, some of you already know the answer to the question. I just want you to think it through as well. And for those that don't know the answer, we're just going thinking it through. If the book is open, what's the implication? Books don't, you don't buy a book like that. You buy a book like, like that. You buy a book closed. If the book is open, the implication is the book has previously been closed. This is very basic, but it's very integral to understanding the Bible passage. So when, that, when in Revelation he says there was an angel, he had a little book in his hand, and the book was open, in order to find out what this book is, we have to find 
we have to find somewhere in the Bible where we find a book that is closed. Does that make sense? Makes sense. So what is the little book that is in the angel's hand? There is nowhere in the Bible apart from one passage where you can find indication of a book that's closed. Now, some people say, well, what's that book, that, that little book that's open in the angel's hand? Well, some people say, well, it could be the, the seven seals in Revelation. This is chapter 10. You've got the seven seals in chapter 6, 5, and 7. Not really. Not really. There's only one place, and it's in Revelation chapter 12. Sorry, not Revelation. I always get it mixed up when I say it is. Daniel chapter 12. And if you go to Daniel chapter 12, if you're not quite sure how to find Daniel, just find Matthew and go back a few pages. Daniel chapter 12. And in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, we have Daniel doing the opposite. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. And the Bible says here in Daniel 12 and verse 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the what? Words and seal the book even till when? To the time of the end. And then it says, many will what? Run to and throw, and knowledge shall be increased. Okay? So here we have Daniel shutting up the book until a specific time. He shuts up the book until the time of the what? Now, when is the time of the end? The verse doesn't tell us. It's at the end, almost, not quite. <laughs> the verse doesn't tell us. It says, seal the book to the what? Time of the end. Now, in order to find the time of the end, let's read verse 5, 6, and 7. It will tell us exactly when the time of the end is. Verse 5, it says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood another two. The one on the one side of the bank, basically that verse doesn't really mean anything to the question we're as asking right now. Verse 6, and one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, here's the question, how long shall what? It be to the end of these wonders. So verse 4 says the book will be sealed until the what? Time of the end. Verse 5, for the purpose of answering this question, we just ignore it. Then verse 6, at the end of the question, it says, how long will it be to the end of? So they're basically asking the question. Verse 7 is then the answer. Verse 7 says, and I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand, and swear by him that lives forever and ever, that it shall be, here's the answer, that it shall be for a what? Time, times, and what? Half a time. So in verse 4, when he says the book will be sealed till the time of the end, verse 6, he asks the question, when is that going to be? Verse 7, he answers the question and says, it will be until a what? Time, times, and half a time. Now, we don't have time, times, and the dividing of times. This phrase comes up about 10 times in Scripture. A time means a year. A times means minimum of two years. And half a time means half a year. Add that up, you get three and a half years. Some passages call it three and a half years. Some say time, times, and half a time. Some say time, times, and dividing of time. And other passages will say 1,260 days, which is the prophetic time period that we believe started in 538 and ended in 1798. This was the time period when the Roman church ruled as a joint geopolitical power. Sorry, religio political power from 538 to 1798. There is a connection between Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 10, and it's integral to our identity as Seventh day Adventists. It's unfortunate that more Adventists understand the link between Daniel 7, the little horn, and Revelation 13, the beast. Now, know the connection between these two chapters. There's more Adventists that can do a Bible study on how the little horn is the same as the beast of Revelation 13 than can connect the book of Daniel chapter 12 with the book of Revelation chapter 10. We should be well-versed in this connection. 
because it forms an integral part of our identity that we still haven't quite got to yet. But these two chapters are linked. One is a sealed book, one is a book opened. You've got the one man on the sea, one foot on the earth, one on the sea. You've got links between these two chapters that go throughout. But it's not the whole book of Daniel that's sealed. It's only a particular part of Daniel that was sealed. Because most of Daniel was understood prior to 1798. For example, when Alexander the Great was conquering the world, he came to Jerusalem, and as he came to Jerusalem, the Hebrews came out to meet him. And they said, please don't destroy our city. You can find this written in Josephus' book. I'm just summarizing it. They said, please don't destroy our city. Come inside. They took him into the temple. They took him to a scroll. They opened the scroll to the book of Daniel, chapter 8. There was no chapters then, but they found chapter 8 as we would read it today. And they read to Alexander the Great in Daniel chapter 8, where it says that a he-goat would destroy the ram. Then they read to Alexander the Great how it says, and the ram is the king of Media and Persia. Then they read in verse 21 where it says, and the he-goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. They read this to Alexander the Great in Jerusalem when he was conquering the world. And Alexander the Great, Josephus writes it this way. He said, he perceived it spoke of himself. And he was very pleased, and he marched on his way, and Jerusalem remained undestroyed. The simple point I'm trying to make is, prior to 1798, people understood certain aspects of the prophecies of Daniel, and even certain aspects of Daniel chapter 8. There's only one part of Daniel that was sealed, and it's Daniel 8, verse 26, where it says, And the vision of the evenings and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up the vision, for it shall be for what? This is the end of Daniel chapter 8. Now, it's incorrect, based on what I just shared with you, to say that the whole of Daniel chapter 8 was sealed. Why? Because Alexander the Great, in a sense, saved Jerusalem because of an understanding of a prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. It's only one aspect of that prophecy that was sealed, the part that dealt with the 2,300 days. That was the part that was shut up. Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, and he said to me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Be cleansed. This verse of scripture would begin to be understood after what date in history? 1798. It was sealed until the time of the end. After 1798, people began to understand and they started studying in the Bible. And in particular, this verse, William Miller was one of them, though there were other men around the world, started to study this verse and realized, as they understood, that they believed Jesus was coming in about 20 years' time. And the birth of the Adventist church was in its very infancy. In order to understand our identity today, it's important to understand our historical experience was rooted in the unpacking of this verse. The sanctuary message is in many ways unique to us as Seventh-day Adventists. The end of the chapter, Daniel, sorry, Revelation chapter 10, is those verses that we're mo slightly more familiar with, where the angel tells Daniel, I'll just summarize, he says, take the book and eat it. It will be in your mouth sweet, but in your belly it will be what? Bitter. So he says, I took the book and ate it. It was in my belly bitter, but before that it was sweet in my mouth. That's an analogy. He was describing the experience of God's people that when they took the book, the prophecy, as they understood it, as they preached it, it would be a sweet experience. They were preaching the soon return of Jesus, and it was a very, very sweet experience. In some ways, that would have been a very amazing time to be alive as a Christian. 
fervently believing based on the evidence you understood that Jesus was coming in just three or ten or five or however many years you understood it's time. And people lived and acted accordingly. They lived and acted accordingly. The eating was the understanding proclamation of the word. The little book was the part of Daniel dealing with 1844. It was sweet because it was a joy to understand, but it was bitter right afterwards. It was bitter right afterwards. The sweet experience wasn't just limited to North America. There's other people around the world. In England, you had Edward Irving, Germany, South America. There were other people around the world who were enjoying this experience, and it was a sweet experience for many, many people. Is our belief in Jesus' return today giving us such, this, such a sweet experience? Or is it just there? Are our thoughts of pensions and retirements and second homes and whatever else? People were actually paying people back money, taking adverts in newspapers. Hey, if there's anything I've done, if I owe anyone any money, let me know. Because Jesus is coming, and I need to sort out these things before I go. They waited all day, and Jesus didn't come. And then it turned bitter. Myself and Anton and Ica, we had the privilege last year to go to William Miller's farm in Low Hampton. And there we stood on what's called Ascension Rock, where the early Adventists, William Miller and the people in his area stood, looking for Jesus' return. As they stood there all day and waited and watched, Hiram Edson writes, our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted and such a spirit of weeping came over us that we have never experienced before. We wept and wept until the day dawned. This guy waited all day Tuesday and then he still waited on Wednesday. Just in case Jesus was keeping time in Australia, I don't know. But like, just, just waited. Just waited. And it says, he lay prostrate for two days without any pain, sick with disappointment. People lived and acted their faith out. We went to a few places as well where farmers left their potatoes in the field. Because they said, why harvest them? Jesus is coming. And there's two instances. We filmed a lineage episode on it. I'll give you guys a sneak preview. There's two instances where two farmers left their, 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 their potatoes in the field. One of them left his potatoes in the field until, until the beginning of November and then went and dug them. And miraculously, all the other potatoes in the area caught a disease that year, the ones that were dug on time. Because he left his in the ground about two months longer, he was the only farmer in the area with any potatoes. And he made a pretty penny. There was another farmer who left his potatoes in the field until March, because snow came. Then he told his wife, I'm going to go dig the potatoes. She said, husband, no. Please. She said, the neighbors have laughed about us enough. If they see you digging the field in March, will be the laughing stock of this community again. He said, nope, I'm going to dig the potatoes. He went up there, put his spade in the ground, and dug up crisp, fresh potatoes that had sat in the ground for six months extra. Had enough potatoes to sell enough potatoes to clear his mortgage and have plenty left over afterwards. There are just two instances of how God looked after his people. Now, there's not all the stories have a happy ending. Not all of them, too. 
But what happened after 1844, Bible historians refer to as the scattering. Because after 1844, what happened is most people over the course of the next year gave up their hope in Jesus' return. It was eventually just a small group that stayed faithful and believed that Jesus was going to come. Then about a year later, God started to gather his believers together again. They were scattered over a misconception of the sanctuary and the second coming. Those who stayed faithful came to a correct understanding of the sanctuary, but it wasn't the sanctuary doctrine that God would use to gather his believers back together again to solidify them, for them to rally around. It would be a different teaching and a different doctrine. Which doctrine was that? It would be the Sabbath. Around 1848, the Sabbath began to be understood. Maybe you learned in your Pathfinder class a lady called Rachel Preston Oaks, who saw Frederick Wheeler preaching on Sunday. And rebuked him after the service. Amen. She was tactful. And then he became the first Sabbath-keeping minister. And then another guy called Preble, this is fascinating, wrote a tract that Jay and Andrews read. Then Uriah Smith, no, Joseph Bates read this same tract that Preble wrote. Then Bates wrote a tract that Ellen White read, and she was convicted on the Sabbath. The sad part is that Preble left the believers three years later, but God did use him. Jan Andrews got converted, Ellen White got converted, and then slowly this belief of the Sabbath, coupled with the sanctuary, would form the defining uniqueness of this new Seventh-day Adventist movement. This is the early stages. Do we have a health message yet, yes or no? Mm -mm. No health message yet. Do we have tithing as a system yet? Mm -mm. There's no tithing. Ministers work for free. The belief on the state of the dead wasn't, wasn't settled yet. But we had the Sabbath and the sanctuary. And then slowly, beliefs would get added as time went along. Revelation 12 talks about the historical experience of the Adventist church. In many ways, it answers the question, where do we come from? Revelation 12 talks about the characteristics of God's church. Revelation 12, and there's a couple of characteristics in Revelation chapter 12 that are interesting and and, and that are unique. And to me, when I look at these characteristics, it gives me greater confidence in knowing that I believe the Seventh-day Adventist church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy. We're not just another church that happens to go to church on a different day of the week and eat weird food. But we are a unique movement specified... In the Bible, not just by our experience, but also by our characteristics. Revelation 12, verse 14, the Bible says, But the woman, a woman in Bible prophecy represents a church, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness where she is nourished for how long? For a time, times, and what? Half a time from the presence of the serpent. Now, what does this text tell us about the woman or the church? What does it tell us? It tells us that during that time period of a time, times, and half a time, where's the woman? What's she doing? She's hiding. Now let's put two and two together and let's get four. If the woman or the church is hiding during this prophetic time period, that would mean that any church that comes into existence during that time cannot be this woman. Make sense? Because the woman's hiding. So if a church comes into existence during that time, it's not that woman. Because that woman, what's she doing? She's hiding. Now this time, times, and half a time, I'll just put it on the screen again. Same time period. 
time is one year, times is two years, half a time is half a year, comes up to 1,260 days. And when we take the Bible prophecy that one day represents a year, we add it up and we come to 1,260 years. And that's from 538 to 1798. 538 is when the Roman church got their religious political power. 1798 is when Napoleon took it away. Stripped the Pope of his civil power and left him as a strictly religious entity. The Church of England came to power or came into existence what year? Roughly, roughly. I don't even know the answer myself. I just, that's why I said roughly. <laughs> It's the 1500s, it's around the 1530s when Henry VIII got tired of his first wife. Around the 1530s. They can't be that church, amen? Methodist church, when did the Methodist church come into existence? The late 1700s. Late 1700s. They also cannot be that, that woman. Because the woman's what? Hiding. The Baptists, when did they come into existence? 16, 1700s? I think. Somewhere around there. They cannot be that woman. Mormons, when do they come into existence? When did they come into existence, church? 1830s, 40s. They could be. Based on this one identifying mark. Jehovah's Witness, when did they come around? 1800s too. Seventh-day Adventists, when did they come around? Same time. Verse 16 says this, but the earth helped the woman. Who's the earth in Bible prophecy in Revelation 12 and 13? Revelation 13, verse 11. The beast comes up out of the earth. The earth was a sparsely populated area, opposed to the sea, which was a populated area. The earth, to summarize a whole long Bible study, represents the United States of America. This woman would arise after 1798 and would arise in the country of the United States of America. Where did the Seventh-day Adventist church arise? USA. Where did the Mormon church arise? USA. Where did the Jehovah's Witness church arise? USA. But then you come to verse 17 and that sorts the men from the boys, so to speak. The Bible says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the what? The remnant or the rest of her offspring who keep the what? Commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. They're, they're, there's more characteristics. The characteristics of God's last day remnant, just a few of them, would be that it would arise after 1798. That would arise on the continent or the country of the United States of America. That they would keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The Seventh-day Adventist church meets all four of those qualifying marks. Where do we come from? Revelation 10, historical experience. What are our characteristics? Who are we today? Revelation 12. Then we have Revelation 14. What does Revelation 14 cover? I believe it covers our message and our mission. Answering the question, not just of why we're here, but where are we going? If you to summarize the message of Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12, there are some key parts to the message of Revelation 14. One of them, fear God and do what? Give glory to Him. One of them is the hour of His judgment, what? Is come. Worship Him who made. That's kind of a reference to the fourth commandment, the Sabbath. Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in the midst. Verse 8, Babylon is fallen. This message would also point out false worship and call it as fallen. 
the mark of the beast message is there in Revelation 14, verse 9, verse 10, verse 11. And then verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that have the, sorry, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You may have heard me say this before. The Adventist church does not have a list of doctrinal beliefs. I know we've got 28 fundamentals, but we do not have a list of doctrinal beliefs. The Adventist church is unlike other churches. If you go to the Baptist church, they've got a list. If you go to a Methodist church, they've got a list. And while we may have a list, I would argue it's not a list, but it is a system. What do I mean by a system? Every belief supports another belief and none of the beliefs contradict another belief. Meaning what we believe on the state of the dead does not contradict our second coming belief, which does not contradict our millennium belief, which goes in line with our hellfire belief. It all is consistent. But you could also argue that there's another belief or teaching that's enwrapped there in Revelation 14 verse 12 that keeps them all together as well. Ellen White has a quotation where she said, the three angels' message. Something like this, I forget the exact quotation, but something like the three angels' message is the message of righteousness by faith. And she uses the word in verity. I forget how it goes in my mind right now. I believe that message of righteousness by faith, that message of practical Christian living, that message of Christ in you what? The hope of glory. The message, if you would phrase it another way, of Christ at the center of everything we do and everything we what? Believe is the glue that takes this from being a list to a system. You may know the 28 beliefs now, but if we're not living and abiding in Christ and understanding how Christ is at the center of everything we do, there's still a disconnect between us and where our identity needs to be. We may know where we come from, 10. We may know who we are, 12. We may even know the minutia of the message, But without that kind of stamp that draws it all together of Christ in us and through us with our identity in him, it just is a lifeless list of details that doesn't really have any cohesion or power. Anyone seen these four boys before? Four men. One of them's called William. One of them is called Wilbur. One of them is called Carlos. And one of them is called Jorge. It's a fascinating story. Fascinating. If I'm ever blessed to have children, some of you may have heard me say this before, maybe not from the pulpit, but I've always said I'd love to have a set of twins. My wife's not so convinced, but I just am fascinated by twins. It's amazing. Here on the screen, you've got two sets of twins. Two sets of identical twins. They were born in Colombia in 1988. Something happened. They were born in two different parts of the country. They both had to go to the hospital for some, I think the babies were sick or something. They went to a hospital, and as they were there in the hospital, two sets of identical twins, one of the nurses 
made a mistake, switched one. Mothers took them home believing they had, as they grew up, because you can't really tell when they're kids, exactly, but as the kids grew up, they grew up believing they had twins, but believing that they weren't identical twins, but they were fraternal twins. One grew up in northern Colombia, poor home, wasn't able to go to school, either of them, had to work from a young age all the way up. The other one grew up in the city, went to school, university, and as they got older, they got jobs as engineers and whatever else. I forget exactly that the jobs were. The ones that were born in the country moved to the city and got a job in a butcher shop. Weren't educated. But there they are working in the butcher shop. And the, the story's long. It's long. But a chance encounter where someone who worked in the office building with Jorge. No, with Carlos. Worked in the office building, no, with Jorge. She's in the butcher's shop, and she saw William. And so she said, hey, William. I mean, hey, Jorge. And William's just like, doesn't know her. But she's seen him because she works with him in the office block. Anyway, through a fascinating series of events of one of them taking the picture and then she showed it to the one in the office block and he saw the picture and said, that's me. And then he went on his Facebook profile and as he went on his Facebook profile and looked at the pictures on, of his real twin's Facebook profile, he then saw a picture with his real twin and his believed twin. And when he saw it, the real twin with the twin... He thought, that's my twin. It's confusing, isn't it? He's like, that's my brother. Anyway, it's a fascinating story. They eventually got together and had a reunion, and it was just about three years ago or so. But the interesting thing is, the one of them, it's, part of it, it's quite a sad story in some ways. I mean, now they're all friends and et cetera, et cetera. They all live together. Um, part of it's quite sad. I think it's William. William would have grown up in the city. He would have grown up in, in a more well-to-do home. He grew up in the country. Couldn't go to school. But he always wanted to go to school. And he says, the only time I got angry at my mother was when I was about 16 or 17. And I got angry and I shouted at my mom. Which wasn't his mom, but he thought it was his mom. It's like, I shouted at my mom. And I told her she should have made me go to school. She should have let me go to school. He lived five hours walk from a school. They would have had to have him walk to school and paid to stay with someone. And the family just couldn't afford it. And he was like, you should have found a way for me to go to school. And when he first found out about his twin in the butcher shop, he sat down and just cried his eyes out. Because he always felt that there was, there was something different between me and my family. Not only did I look different, but my personality and everything was different. And when they got together, it was fascinating. And it's a whole argument of nature, nurture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they found that even growing up in completely opposite homes, they had the same characteristics. But he always felt something was missing. And the other one was on Carlos. Carlos grew up in the city. He grew up in the, the nicer life, so to speak. But he always felt the odd one out in his family, even though he was a twin. He didn't look like his twin. He didn't look like his brothers and sisters. He didn't look like his parents. And his personality was different to all of them. And he always felt growing up there was something not quite right. Friends, when we grow up and live our lives without our identity in Jesus Christ, there will always be a feeling of we're missing something. 
there will always be a feeling that we're out of place. There will always be that feeling that this is not, where, where is my family? There will always be that feeling that there's something else we should have. Our identity needs to be in Jesus Christ, in his family, for that's where we feel at home.